and welcome to this session about phishing threats. Now, as you can see from the subtitle of the slide, what I'm going to be talking about here is what I'm terming classic phishing. So where the message isn't in any way particularly targeted towards particular individuals or particular organizations. So we're not talking about spear phishing threats that have come to more prominence in recent years, but the sort of phishing messages that have now been doing the rounds for a good decade or so, but are still finding a way to reach potential victims and to cause problems. So if we look at phishing as a threat, it's one of those that falls into the category of something that can have a direct potential to affect and to reach end users. So that's not true for all types of internet threat that you might encounter, but phishing, along with things like malware, have the potential to reach the user directly, and so there's a relevance in the user being not only protected, but also aware of the threat and what they ought to do about it. Because if they're not protected and if they're not aware, it has the potential to affect them as a private individual, but also potentially their employer, their organisation organization if they're tricked into parting with information that is sensitive to their workplace, for example. Now, phishing is a threat as a consequence of this because it, it directly appeals to the end user and it's trying to address them and trying to compromise them. It's something that we can't rely on technology alone providing a solution for. There's a need for the end user to be aware of the threat and to be able to, where possible, spot the signs of what they should be looking for. Now, in terms of more advanced, if you like, spear phishing threats, that becomes progressively more difficult because by nature they are targeted and potentially more convincing to the recipients. But in the case of classic phishing, there is a potential for people to be able to spot the signs that typically hallmark and earmark these messages as being a scam rather than legitimate correspondence. So within this session, we're going to have a look at some of those indications that you might find. Now, it's relevant just before we start going into that to, to actually evidence the fact that phishing is still a significant problem, even a, a decade or so later, as I say, from it first coming to media attention and getting prominence. So if we look at the results from the 2013 Information Security Breaches Survey in the UK, which had around 1,400 organisations as respondents, the survey says that the reports of such attacks, to quote it, have increased significantly. And it's been a big issue for small business respondents, which make up a fair proportion of the ISBS respondent base. And several of the affected organisations have reported that they have to deal with such attacks several times a day. So it becomes an issue within the workplace and the potential for staff, employees to respond to these messages and to inadvertently divulge sensitive information. If we look at another source, the Anti-Phishing Working Group has been tracking phishing trends for many years now. Their latest report, at least at the time of talking, actually indicates a decline in phishing attacks during the first quarter of this year, in 2013. But that's worth setting against the fact that in 2012, there had actually been attacks reaching record levels. So there's been a relative decline, but nonetheless, overall, phishing is still a very significant problem. And we can evidence that by doing a comparison between what the, the reported levels across that first quarter were versus back along when the anti-phishing working group first started reporting. So 35,024 phishing sites were detected in February of 2013, and that was apparently the lowest observation since October of 2011. Um, but this quarterly average for quarter one of 2013 was still 39,358 distinct sites detected per month, and that was compared to, let's say, 27,072 back in quarter one of 2008, when the anti-phishing working group first started tracking matters in this fashion. Okay, so a tangible rise over the years nonetheless, even though the month-to-month -month average or month-to-month -month total for February of 2013 was actually less than had been seen for some time. So while the precise levels may fluctuate, the threat itself still remains very significant. So let's have a look then at a particular example of what I'm terming here the classic phishing scam. And this really is an example of a classic scam in the sense that it's financially motivated. It's a, a message in this case that's dressed up as coming from a bank, in this particular case, the cooperative bank. Um, but it's worth noting this could be anyone. Um, the fact that this is masquerading as a co-op doesn't say anything at all about the level of protection or the level of trustworthiness of the cooperative bank as an entity. They're being basically masqueraded as they're being impersonated, um, it's not their fault that that has actually occurred to them. And in actual fact, as it says on the slide, this could be an indirect indication of their popularity as a brand, um, because 
if you're impersonating a well-known target and then sending the messages off in an ad hoc fashion, you've got more potential chance of that message reaching somebody who is actually a customer of that bank and could therefore be taken in by the communication. So, the message arrived, and in this particular case, the title of the message was Technical Issues on Your Account. So it really is dressed up as the sort of thing that many of these classic scams claim to be, something where there's a problem with your account and you need to do something in order to verify your account details in order to enable your account to continue to operate as normal. So the pretext is something that says you need to act in order for your service to be maintained as you want it. Okay, so what we're going to look at now is the nature of the message, the text, and some of the potential giveaways that this might not be legitimate communication. So the first indication that I would flag here is that it's not addressing the recipient by name. It's talking here about dear valued cooperative customer. Now if it was genuine communication from the bank, there is a strong chance that they could actually address you as a known customer and address you by name. So here's the first thing that perhaps ought to be raising suspicion. Next indicator, and it's by no means a certainty that anything with this is, is necessarily bogus, but it adds again more weight to the fact that this might not be legitimate, is the fact that this has not got a particularly professional style of writing in it. So it is either your details have been changed or incomplete. doesn't read particularly well as an English language sentence. And you would expect an organisation like the Cooperative Bank to perhaps check their communications more fully than that before sending them out. So that again ought to raise some suspicion. Next one is the fact that it's, it's asking the user to perform an action that really is the sort of the classic phishing scam pretext. Please verify your details. Go through to a web form and provide a variety of information to check that we've got it held correctly. So in the process of doing so, what the user would of course be doing here is providing a wealth of information to the would-be attacker and placing that information in their hands so that they can exploit it. And we'll see that as we move through in a moment. The next aspect that is potentially suspicious is the fact that the user is being asked to click a link within the message, to, to directly click from there through to wherever that link might take them. Now, of course, if the user has a degree of security awareness and uh, wants to check, they can hover over that link with their mouse and reveal where the, the link is actually taken. It will ultimately pop up the URL. If they're using a tablet or smartphone type device, pressing and holding on the link should yield the same effect. But by default, it's not telling them where they're going. And so the less informed user might well just click that without having a clear idea of where it's going to take them. And of course, in this particular case, where it's taking them is the scam site. Now, the final potential indication here is that there isn't a named sender of the message. It's a generic sign-off from the cooperative bank. Now, that, again, doesn't necessarily mean it's got to be bogus. You find legitimate messages that are signed off in the same way. But it's another indication. It's not giving the user any means of contacting a particular person back to find out whether this was legitimate communication or not. So all in all, with those five or so indications within the message, it adds up to something that looks quite suspicious. To me, at least. But if somebody was to click the message, let's see where it would take them. And what it takes them to first is something that is an exact duplicate of the normal login page for the Cooperative Bank's online banking service. So if you were to go to the phishing site, you get this. If you were to go to the genuine co-op banking site, you would get this as well. So it's exactly the same look and feel, but of course what we've got here is the bogus site. So the user provides either their sort code and their account number or their credit card number to complete this stage of the process, and they click through, and then they get this. And this is asking for a significant range of information because, of course, they're being asked to verify their details. So if we look at the sort of things being asked for here, they've got um, their full name, the first school they attended, their place of birth, their memorable name that they used to verify aspects on their account, um, the last school they attended. So all of these would be things that would be the security check questions that the cooperative bank would use when trying to determine whether they're talking to the, the legitimate customer or not. And at the top there, they're asked for their full security code, which is four digits long. So they're asked to divulge the whole thing. Now this is very different to what you would get on a normal cooperative bank login. Okay, so the normal 
next step after putting in your account details, sort code or your credit card number would be to see this particular page, which is just asking you for selected digits from your security code and none of the other information. Okay? And so this is, this is very different. So, of course, it's been dressed up as verifying your details. So perhaps from the unsuspecting user's perspective, it's natural that they're being asked for all of that information. But absolutely, they shouldn't be providing it. And that is the nature of the scam that's involved here, to trick them into parting with all the information that would allow somebody else then to exploit their account. And of course, this isn't the only guise in which such generic types of phishing can occur. So here's two examples of messages I've received uh, quite recently. Now, in these particular cases, you can see that they've been flagged as junk messages, so they, they've already got some level of warning to me that they're not legitimate. Um, but in both cases here, it's, it's going along the lines of a password-related scam. So the idea is to, to capture your user ID and password to potentially exploit whatever account that relates to. So both of them going along the same sort of pretext. Your password will expire in three days. Click here to validate your email. So it's your email account that they're talking about. Um, and it's signed off from system administrator in both cases. So again, not a name sender, but this is the sort of thing that could fly around to people within any organization or indeed private individuals um, thinking it might be from their ISP for their, their email there. And they could be divulging sensitive account details that would allow their email account to be exploited and used by somebody else. Okay, so these, these sorts of things are hopefully things that increasingly people would be aware of. And to be, to be able to spot these sort of signs of messages that are just trying to get you to validate something, to click a link in the message, um, and to go and provide overtly sensitive information onto a website that you don't necessarily know that you can trust, these are the things we want people to be aware of. But in some cases, the waters get muddied by the fact that you can still get legitimate correspondence coming through that has some of the hallmarks of phishing messages like we've just looked at. So let's have a look at another, or another couple of examples, actually. So firstly, um, this one here, which is actually another phishing message. This one now dressed up as being from a different bank. This is from Barclays Bank, or claiming to be, of course. And it's the same sort of pretext here. Um, it's urgent action required on the part of the user because their membership number and memorable information will be expired on the 9th of August of 2013. Well, that at the time of speaking, that time has passed, so their account's already expired. Um, but this, of course, is another phishing scam. And the idea is that they will click um, on the continue here link and follow that through to provide the necessary information. And what you can see on this particular screenshot is that I've hovered over that link to find out where it's actually going. And you can see there that it's got nothing to do with anything that looks like a legitimate Barclays banking website. So that ought to be warning enough to somebody not to click through and follow it. But of course, as I say, many users won't be aware enough to do that. They won't know that hovering over the link will, will reveal where it's going. And some of them, even if they see the address, might not be wise enough to think, OK, that doesn't look like the legitimate Barclays address. I shouldn't go to it. So we can't rely on everybody taking that sort of step. But nonetheless, there we are. That's a, another phishing message. Now, let's compare and contrast with the sort of advice that users then get on some of the banking services. So if we, if we look at how uh, Barclays provide advice, and I've got two aspects here. One from the Barclays Direct service, which pertains to a message I'm about to show you, and also from their wider online banking site. So on the, the Barclays Direct website, which was formerly known as ING Direct, hence the, the text in the quote below, ING Direct will never send you emails asking for your confidential or personal security information. If you receive any such request, do not act on the instructions given in the email, but contact us immediately. So that's what is said for the ING Direct, Barclays Direct service. And then on Barclays' wider online banking site, the advice that's given under the heading Beware of Scams is never divulge pin sentry codes to a caller or in response to an email or a text. Now, pin sentry is a device that Barclays provide to customers to enable them to complete their online banking login, and of course that's sensitive information that they shouldn't divulge. But both of these bits of advice are perhaps fairly targeted, fairly narrow bits of advice. So specifically talking about pin sentry and talking about um, won't send you emails asking for confidential or personal information. Although what they also do, in addition to what I've described as that fairly narrow advice, is to provide a link off to 
the Bank Safe Online website and the guidance that that provides um, further about preventing phishing and other types of online threat. So if we look at this particular information, then there's, there's wider guidance that users can receive in order to be aware of how to protect themselves. Now, looking at the next message, this is another one that purports to be from Barclays, and in this particular case, it is actually a genuine message. It's from the Barclays Direct site, the formerly ING Direct one, and this is genuine correspondence. Um, and there, yeah, there, there's an indication there that it's somewhat more legitimate because it is being sent to a named recipient, but that in itself doesn't necessarily mean that it can't be a scam. It could be spear phishing. You could be specifically targeted there if somebody knows that you're a Barclays account holder. And reading the rest of the message, it's saying that your statement is available to view and what it's soliciting you to do is click the link within the message to then go and view your statement. Now in this particular case, okay, you can see the link there. It's not just saying click here, it's saying visit ingdirect.co.uk uh, and if you hover over that link, you find it's a live link and you can click through. Now, Okay, it's not saying you've got to verify your account details, but in the process of going to view your statement, you will have to log in to the site, so you'll be providing your sensitive information in terms of login credentials, and uh, that would still give an opportunity for a scam site to do the same thing. So, the fact that it's, not, that it's showing an address and not saying click here doesn't implicitly make it any more trustworthy, okay? Uh, a bogus email could quite equally put ingdirect.co.uk and then link off somewhere else. So it's still reliant on the user having the awareness to hover over it and check that it's going to the right place. So actually, um, in terms of this message, it has what I would describe as two key hallmarks of a scam. Um, it's asking recipients or suggesting that recipients can click a link in the message to perform the next step rather than saying just go and log into your online banking site as normal and relying on them to, to type the address in or go to it from their history where they trust where they've been to. And it's a message again sent by somebody without a name attached to it, somebody they can't reply to it explicitly says you can't reply to this message. And so it's not creating a great degree of confidence there that it's from a legitimate person that the user could verify the identity of. And now if we, if we have a look back at that Bank Safe Online website and the advice that that was giving, one of the specific bits that it suggests to avoid phishing is never go to a website from a link in an email and then enter personal details, as the email could be from a fraudulent source. Okay, so this is advice that Barclays link to from their online banking site, but they are then sending out a message that actually contradicts some of that, because they are at least giving people the option to click a link within a message, and by them following that through and logging in through there, they are providing sensitive information, sensitive personal details, by way of their login credentials at the very least. Now, going back to the Barclays Direct message, if you look very closely and if you read what is literally the small print within the message um, further down, there are things that can be seen that give a little bit more confidence that it must be from somebody who at least knows your account details and therefore is more likely to be legitimate. Because it says there to verify it from Barclays Direct, please check that the following three digits match the last three digits of your customer number. So if the user knows that and that your name is such and such, so if they don't match, they know they're being scammed. But of course, this is right at the bottom of the message. It's in smaller print and it's coming after the bit where the user is being told something's available for you to look at. Click the link to find out. Okay, so again, it, it is a genuine message, but it's relying upon the user to have that little bit more awareness to actually be assured that it's genuine as opposed to being a scam because the first bit of the message actually isn't too distinguishable other than the fact that it's saying it to you as a named recipient. It's not that distinguishable from the way that a phishing scam might work. And just because it's not saying verify your account details, it's using potentially a softer pretext, your statement is available for you to view, well, that actually might be more convincing for some people because it doesn't sound like the normal sort of thing that a phishing scam would attempt to use. Phishing scams are always trying to create that sense of urgency. So here's a message that's not. So that must be legitimate. Well, phishing scammers could take advantage of that and use that pretext instead, just the softer approach, your, your statement's available to view, and that could be the basis of the phishing scam instead of verifying your details. Okay. 
So, I said, there's plenty of advice out there in terms of avoiding fishing. That Bank Safe Online site is worth having a look at for the advice that that provides. But what I'll end with here is just, a, well, as I've termed it, a checklist, an acronym list um, for legitimacy, importance, source, and timing as things that we as recipients of messages or indeed as recipients of phone calls or other contact from people who might be trying to fish or social engineers can bear in mind as little checks before we go ahead and divulge information or perform actions that we're perhaps being asked to undertake. So the L in this acronym um, stands for legitimacy. So the questions to ask there are, does the request seem legitimate and usual? Should you be asked to provide the information and is this normally how you'd be asked to provide it? So, for example, in the context of those banking phishing messages, would you normally be asked to provide all of your account details in that way? Well, no, actually, if you have a look at what the banking sites will say on their website and their frequently asked questions and their security guidance, many of them will explicitly say to you, no, that's not the way we would do it. Um, Importance. What's the value of the information you're being asked to provide or the task you're being asked to perform? And how might it be misused? Well, in the context of that banking information, it's very important because it's basically the keys to your account. And it's quite obvious how that could be misused in the wrong hands. The source. Are you confident that the source of the request is genuine? Can you find a way to check? Well, actually, in all of those messages, it's a little bit more difficult because there isn't a named sender. But at least in the case of the message that would have turned out to be legitimate, there is a phone number you could call and you know, that would provide, you could match that up with being the actual phone number for Barclays um, ING Direct Service, for example, and you would then be assured you're talking to legitimate people. And the timing. Do you have to respond now? Is it something that you have to do? And of course, that's where the pretext for some of the phishing messages I showed is trying to create that sense of urgency. You know, it's trying to stop you having that opportunity to think, you need to verify your account details, you need to do such and such within a certain number of days or something will expire, you will lose access to something. So it's trying to create the sense of urgency for you to do it and not think about this. And the key thing is just to take that pause for breath and think about what you're being asked to do and whether you absolutely have to do it there and then or whether you can wait five minutes and reflect. And if you still have doubts, take the time to make the further checks or ask somebody else for help or advice. Okay, there's very few things where you absolutely have to act right at that instant when you receive something without the opportunity to take any further information into account. Okay, so that's the end of the session. Some contact details there and uh, details of our Research Centre website. And I hope that's been informative and helps to further guard against at least these classic phishing scams. Thank you very much.